So Wednesday night was this wonderful night of uh, just celebration of what God's been doing. I think that it's very easy for us, and this goes along with our message in Joshua, it goes, it's very easy for us to kind of get fixated on the things that we see and not understand or even pay attention to the things we don't see. Uh, and one of the things we wanted to convey to all of uh, the people here at The Way is that there are massive things going on. It's hard for us to, to show you everything. Um, but you need to know uh, that God's doing amazing things. And so we would literally, at three particular times, we have this stage filled with leaders. Um, we had staff up here, we had our consistory up here, and we had all of our ministry leaders that were standing up here. It doesn't even count the volunteers and all the people that are doing things. And so it's been really, really powerful to see. Um, I think that we are moving into a season of perspective. Uh, and probably if you were kind of to describe the major battle uh, that we battle this time of year, it's maintaining perspective the proper perspective. We have begun Advent, uh, which Advent is this wonderful church season. Um, there's a lot of ecumenical things that go with Advent, and um, you know, we, we as the way, we kind of weave in and out of a lot of those things, um, but what I want to kind of convey to you about Advent is Advent, so you, you kind of have, so Advent kind of kicks off the church year. Um, and we have two major uh, seasons of reflection. We have Advent and we have Lent. Advent precedes Christmas. Lent precedes Easter. Now, the truth is, is that there's kind of a different aspect to each. So at Advent, we focus on uh, this, what they call anticipation and hope in the waiting. So we, we talk about in the Old Testament they were waiting for God to do something. The world was broken. It was filled with sin. It's filled with all kinds of death and tragedy, just as it is today. But they had these promises throughout the history of the Old Testament. They had these promises that something was going, God was doing something about it. He's not just sitting back. Now, he may not be doing it on their time frame or ours, but God is constantly working and he's inviting his people to be a part of it. Um, somewhere along the line, we adopted this consumer mindset about church, which basically is if I show up occasionally, I'm gonna get something out of it. Uh-uh. You might get inspired for a, for a Sunday, you might, you might leave here feeling good, but you're not equipped to deal with what the world's gonna throw at you. The way that you get equipped and the way that you continue to grow and the hope and the joy is cultivated in your life is by participating in what God is doing. That, that's it. Um, if you would, on a scale of one to 10, uh, as far as discipleship is concerned, uh, you know, Sunday mornings are like a two or a three. Um, it's everything else that goes with it. And so I know that for a lot of Americans, a lot of people throughout the world, they don't necessarily uh, participate in the ways that they're invited to participate. And then the, the result, they don't get the results that they're promised. The results are this. They come from obedience. They come from drawing closer to Christ. So we have this Advent season. We focus on the first coming. We know that people were in anticipation, they were faithful, they were waiting. And then we have this account of God coming to earth, be becoming man in Jesus Christ and dwelling among his creation. We have an account of him saving them from their sins through his death and resurrection. And now we live in this time where we are anticipating his return. But we can forget that. And we can turn Christmas, you know, I'm all for the baby Jesus. But if, if your idea of God is the baby in the manger, you might want to add to your perspective. You see, God came in a helpless, harmless uh, way. 
uh, so that people, uh, you know, it, when God moves, it's kind of scary and it's kind of intense. So God kind of, he kind of came into the world in a way that was not threatening. And, and it was powerful the way that Jesus lived his life. He lived this perfect life of suffering and he was obedient to the Father all the way to death. And he was raised in glory. So we wait for him to come back. Now he's not coming back as a baby. All we have to do is read the book of Revelation. We see he's coming back as the Lord of all lords and the King of all kings. And every knee will bow, whether they believe or not. And every tongue will confess that he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. So now what do we do in the waiting? We make room for Christ in our lives. And it's just crazy. We live in this season where we get so busy that we have anything but room for Christ in our lives. And we sit there, and, we, we, you know, and, and I'm telling you, this happens whether we acknowledge it and participate in it or not. Trust me from the person whose job is to meet people in all their suffering. It's coming. And the question is, are you prepared for it? I'll never forget, years ago, I went to a funeral from somebody I deeply love. It was a very tragic funeral. And I saw it was a parent who lost their child. And I saw the father stand there at the head of his son's casket. And he said these words. He said, if you, before you ever come to a moment like this in your life, you better have things settled with God. never forget that. People wait. They wait until stuff gets hard. Then they go to God. It's like now is the time. Now is the time to get settled with God. Now is the time to make room for Christ in your life because hard things are coming. The battle is not yet over. We're still, we're still engaged in it. We've been following uh, this, uh, this account of Joshua, and we have seen the Israelites moving into the promised land. And again, we have all these promises from God. Wherever you set your foot, that's land that I've given you. Be strong and courageous. Do not fear. For wherever you go, I'll be with you. These are things we have to be settled in. Because as soon as they cross that Jordan, that's when all the battles begun. And now we, we were at a point, we, we've been working our way through this chapter, uh, through this uh, book, and we've gotten to the point where the major fighting is over, um, the major battles. But they still, they have to possess the land. We now go through the process where the land is being distributed to the 12 tribes, to the, to the sons the descendants of the sons of Jacob, and, 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 and all these things are happening. And, and, and so uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot to glean from this part of Scripture. So what I want to do is, I thought, okay, so over the next several chapters, we're going we're gonna to see the, the, tri the tri tribes of Israel represented. And I'm thinking, okay, what would be a good way to teach the people about the, the 12 tribes of Israel? And so, and I found, and I thought, what better way to learn something than a, through a song? So I found a song. So we're, I'm going to show you this video, and then we're going to come back and pray as we come before the word, but enjoy this video. I figured since there's no rush today, all of us adults would use this as an opportunity to watch a kid's song to learn about the 12 tribes of Israel. Because we all know that already, right? We, we already know these things. Yeah, okay. Let's pray before we come before the word. Father God, I thank you so much for your word today. I just continue to thank you for the hope that it gives us, Lord, um, just your faithfulness through, through time and the ways that you, um, as we study in Joshua, you use events to bring about the salvation of the world. And so, Lord, we just, we just, we just thank you for that. We ask that you grant us understanding of your word and help us uh, just to continue to, to cultivate uh, tender and responsive hearts to you and uh, Lord, just transform our minds. We pray this all in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. So we begin. Uh, I, now, last week, if you were here, remember, they, we talked about counting the victories. And I hope, as you went through Thanksgiving, uh, that a lot of you had an opportunity to do that. 
uh, reminding yourself that, you know what, there have been some successes. God is moving. Now, as you see uh, the land being dispersed, being distributed, and, and people starting to move into possessing the land, all throughout this series, we've been talking about parallels, parallels between the, the Israelites and Joshua and Jesus and his people. So if, as we study this and we look at the people possessing the land, what's kind of the modern day parallel? The modern day parallel is that, in essence, Jesus is the land. So as you move through life, as a Christian, you should be growing in greater possession of Christ. And he should be possessing greater places within you. I, I, please hear me clearly on this. I say it time and time again, and, and if I feel a little uh, emotional, it's because I deal with people that have sat in church for years and years and years and years that completely walk away from these things. So I want you to hear my heart. I want you to hear it as a blessing, but I want you to hear it as a warning. You, as a Christian, if you are born again by the Holy Spirit, you should be growing in Christ-centeredness. You should, in some way, shape, or form, you should be growing. Doesn't mean your life's getting easier. Doesn't mean the battles are becoming fewer. But you should, be, if you can plot out to who you were versus who you are, there should be growth. Your life, when you begin and you first come to Christ, your lives are all about you. Now, maybe they're about your family, Maybe, maybe, maybe they're about your job, whatever it is. But, but first and foremost in your mind is how everything around you affects you. As you grow in Christ, that should start shifting. And that everything now is about Christ. Everything. Your jobs, the ways that you interact with your family, where you go socially, all of these things become everly increasing about Jesus. If, if that's not happening, then you're not getting ready for heaven. And, and so this is, this is the work of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit wants to do this in your life. And I know it's difficult, and, and if you could plot it out, it probably looks, you know, a lot of ups and downs and, and all of these things, but nonetheless, it's, it's gradually working itself to a point of Christ-centeredness. How much is Jesus the center of your life? Is, he, is, is it becoming more? Because uh, part of the reality is, you know, even before we begin in chapter 13, they, they, they are, you know, the, the heading says the land yet to be conquered. The truth of the matter is, is that they still, to this day, have never fully possessed the land that God promised them. To this day. And unfortunately, that can be the story of our lives. We can find ourselves at the end of our lives and never having possessed the full promises from God. I see it all the time. And the, que the question is, what are you going to do about it? Are, are you going to be that person that, that lives your, life, your, your whole life for you? And then at the end of your life, you know, what then? What then? And so, uh, so, so here's that picture. So it's this invitation, and, and it's a big part of where we go. So Joshua 13, it begins, um, it says, When Joshua was an old man, the Lord said to him, You're growing old, and much land remains to be conquered. So, you know, um, I guess that means you're old if God tells you you're old. You know, it's one thing for somebody to say, you know, because we tend to think anybody older than us is old. Perhaps, I don't know. I, it's amazing how the older I get, how much higher the ceiling of old goes to. You know, when I was younger, it was, it was here, and now that I'm pushing 50, it's, it's way up here now. It's amazing. But I just thought for fun, as we talk about old, you know, old, getting old is one of those things. You know, we got to joke about just a little bit, right? 
But, you know, we know the Jeff Fox where the you might be a redneck if jokes. Well, I've come up with some, you know, you're getting older if jokes. Okay? So I did, did some searching on the internet. Um, uh, so it says, it says, when you've been there and done that, but you don't remember what that was, you might be getting older. When you stop growing at both ends and start growing in the middle, you might be getting older. If the only color you turn at the beach is blue because you're holding in your gut, you might be getting older. <laughs> if you have developed the fine skill of being able to cough, sneeze, go number one, go number two, all at the same time, you're getting older. <sighs> when you step on an elevator and you hear your favorite songs being played, <laughs> you might be getting older. When you're told to slow down by your doctor and no longer the police, <laughs> you might be getting older. When you realize that there's nothing left to learn the hard way anymore, you might be getting older. Uh, when you are too old to care, you're getting older. And the last one is when you go to an antique store and you see things for sale that when you were younger you threw away. <laughs> you know you're getting older. Anyway, so here we go. So how old was Joshua? Joshua was probably right around 90. And there's a couple things here. One is uh, God says to him, you're getting older, but he's not, he's not trying to discourage Joshua. He's saying to him, there's a lot of stuff left to be done. And so if there's a message here today, it's that people at all stages of life have value and significance. All stages. There is not a stage where you are no longer useful or you, your life is irrelevant. There's not that stage. There may be things that transition in your life because you're not physically able to do what you used to do, but there's a lot of things that we can do until the day we die. One is we can grow in wisdom. That requires very little uh, physical exertion, um, but as we go through life experiences, as we uh, kind of uh, uh, focus on the things that follow, what we can be growing in that benefits the people around us is wisdom. I told you stories, I was blessed. Um, when we moved back to Pella in 1998, I still had all my grandparents. And I'll tell you what, my grandparents were wise. And you know, when I was, so I was 28 years old in 1998, and I had all the ambition and energy of the world, but I didn't have the wisdom. And I had resources that I could go to, and it was invaluable to me. Uh, for a lot of you, you may not feel like you have that. And, and just for the record, wisdom is kind of seen by the fruit that it bears, right? So just because a person is a certain age doesn't make them wise. You can't neglect. I, to me, wisdom is completely rooted in God. There's a lot of people that espouse all kinds of worldly wisdom. That's just garbage, and sometimes I hear that and I think to myself, wow, worldly wisdom is, is an oxymoron. I mean, it's, it's just a joke. I remember one, one year I did a message on worldly wisdom and I, and I, and as, as kind of, you know, I like to kind of light, when you're talking about a hard subject, you like to kind of say some funny things. So I went and um, there, there's actually a resource where you can look at some of uh, the directions that are out there for various things. And, and you know, the old saying about directions, you know, some, have you ever read directions sometimes? And it's like, well, who put that in there? Nobody would do that. I mean, like warnings, don't do this. It's like, well, who on earth would do that? Well, the reason why it's in there is because somebody did it, right? And so, and so, you know, human wisdom is fleeting. Where do you get your wisdom from? If somebody comes to you in the middle of a crisis and they're seeking wisdom from you, if you're giving them anything other than God's word, you're kidding yourself. 
Oftentimes, I, I, I'm, just, I'm blown away by the wisdom that's offered when, when a marriage is breaking up. And, I, and, and we, we have all these wise people that come in and offer, offer all this worldly wisdom. It's like, in my world, marriage is a covenant. According to God, it's a big deal. Doesn't mean that there won't be trouble. It doesn't mean that, that sometimes marriages come to an end. But boy, before we just encourage people to walk away from their spouse, perhaps we better see what God has to say about it. How about politics? Not everything is clearly, is clearly defined in Scripture, but what about the things that are? Is your ideology raised above your theology? So if somebody is a politician and they tell you that this is the right thing to do, is it? Are you smart enough, wise enough to be able to, to manage all the misinformation the world throws at you? Are you completely subject to what they offer? So wisdom is something you can constantly grow in. And along those sides, what fuels that is growing in the word. I'll tell you what, if you've lived a long life, if you've been a Christian for a long time, are you learning the scriptures? Are you growing in your knowledge of scripture? If not, why not? Do you not have time for it? Is it not a big priority in your life? You know, when they asked Billy Graham what's his one regret in life, you know what he said? He didn't read enough scripture. Billy Graham. Billy Graham is the person that said that every day he starts out with a proverb and a psalm. Every day. He says the proverb teaches him about man and the psalms teaches him about God. So that's how he starts out every morning. If you, uh, if you have like a Bible and a year reading plan, uh, which I, I haven't done, I've, I've taken this year off, so that means next year, about every other year, I, as part of my devotions, I do the Bible in a year. It always has a scripture, but then it always includes a psalm and a proverb every day. And so are we growing in our knowledge of scripture? This isn't just for pastors, church leaders, and this is for everybody. That's the second one. The third one is, are you growing in your relationship with Christ? Are you possessing more and more of Jesus? Because if you want to know what it looks like to live a good life, so at the end of your life, you're sitting there and as you reflect on your, what does it mean to run a good race? What it means to run a good race is that as you lay there, if you have an opportunity to contemplate your life, you've grown in these three areas. You've grown wiser in godly wisdom. You have grown in the word of God. You've learned the word of God. You've grown in your knowledge of the word of God. And you have possessed more and more of Jesus in your life. The people that don't do this are missing out on the promises. They're missing out on all the good stuff. And it's quite possibly that all they have is religion, which... Religion may, religion may get you to the end, but it doesn't really give you what you need, right? And so, so as we kind of look at this again, uh, so Joshua, even though he was old, he was 90 years old, God is saying to him, you got more to do. You're still here for a reason. Now what's interesting too is that they're about to embark on something, a mission, if you will, that Joshua himself can't finish. He, it, it's, it's a long-term vision. Uh, but that, that's the whole point, too. So if you look throughout history, throughout the history of the church, you have these pictures of people that are walking in obedience to God, but as you stack them all together, you see this movement of God through his people. It's fascinating to me. I, 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 I do find it quite interesting uh, to go through cemeteries. And, you know, obviously I go and visit my, my fathers there and my grandparents, and, and, I, and I take my kids there. Every Memorial Day we go to the cemetery. But, you know, the cemetery is, if you think about it, it's this glimpse into history of the people that lived and some of the things that God did through them. 
and how God, you know, if you go, if you go to the one in Pella, uh, where my father's buried, you'll see Domini Sculti, the founder, the founder of Pella. And you'll see other names throughout history, people that lived in this window of time, and God used them powerfully to do things that, that bring things to where they are today. Are you one of those people? As they say, you know, when we're gone and all that's left is a marker to define our life, our life is reduced down to that little dash between the dates. Born on, died on. But that dash says a lot. It says a lot about who God was in your life. The family, your, your, your legacy, your kids, all the things that are behind you. Um, you, you see, Joshua, he, he's laying down a legacy this is something that still to this day is being carried out. Things are still being done long, thousands of years after he died. But he's being faithful. God says to him. Now, the other thing that's interesting is as God does this, he literally lays out the, the boundaries. So as we divide, the, as we divide we're going to start by looking at the east side of the Jordan, the two and a half tribes. And the one thing I wanted you to see, too, because we talk about the, the tribe of Manasseh. Manasseh, so Manasseh and Ephraim are the two tribes that actually belong to Joseph, that were distributed to his grandsons. They, they bear the name, or his sons, they bear the names of Joseph's sons because Levi didn't get land. And we'll talk about that in Scripture here. The, the tribe of Levi, they, they were uh, assigned to be priests, uh, a, a, lineage, a, a lineage of priests, and so they didn't possess any land. But let's go to our text again. So again, he's growing old. Much land remains to be conquered. Uh, the major fighting is over, but there's a lot of fighting still to be done. Uh, he, it says in verse 2, this is the territory that remains. All the regions of the Philistines and the Jeshurites and the larger territory of the Canaanites, extending from the stream of Shihor on the border of Egypt northward, northward to the boundary of Ekron, including, includes the territory of the five Philistine rulers of Gaza, Ashdod, Ash, Ashkelon, Gath, and Ekron. The land of the Avites in the south also remains to be conquered. In the north, the following area has not yet been conquered. All the land of the Canaanites, including Mira, which belongs to the Sidonians, stretching northward to Aphek on the corner of the Amorites, on the border of the Amorites, the land of the Jebelites, and all of the Lebanon mountain area to the east from Balgad below Mount Hermon to the Lebo Hamath and all the hill country and Lebanon Misrepho Maim, including all the lands of the Sidonians. I myself will drive these people out of the land ahead of the Israelites, so be sure to give this land to Israel as a special possession, just as I've commanded you. Include all this territory as Israel's possession when you divide this land among the nine tribes and the half tribe of Manasseh. So remember, this is all east of the Jordan. This is actually not the promised land, but as they were coming out of the wilderness and as they fought their way to the Jordan, you had these tribes, the, 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 the two and a half tribes that said, we kind of like this land. But the deal was they had to cross the Jordan, they had to send their warriors into the, to the west of the Jordan and help conquer the land. So now they're at the point where they're going back, and they're taking that. Uh, so half the tribe of Manasseh and the tribes of Reuben and Gad had already received their grants of land on the east side of the Jordan for Moses. The servant of the Lord had previously assigned this land to them. Now, a uh, quick note about Reuben, and I want to be careful how I say this. You know, the Bible in itself, the Bible is just brutally honest. But Reuben was the oldest son of Jacob. And if you're familiar with your scripture, typically the oldest son gets a double portion. So if he had 12 kids, he'd have 13 portions, two of which going to the oldest. Um, that didn't happen because Reuben did something bad. Reuben uh, had a moment of, um, 
what's the word I want to say? Indiscretion? He had a moment of indiscretion with uh, one of Jacob's concubines. And so, um, basically, when Jacob was dying, he basically said to Reuben, I'm taking away your double portion, and I'm giving it to Joseph. And so, if you look at the map, you're going to see Manasseh has this huge, huge portion of the promised land. And uh, it's, quite, it's quite something. Um, but that kind of leads to that. So, it, and Reuben ha- and Gad, they don't have a big portion. So there's also something to kind of be said about how obedience brings about a larger possession. Um, So this is not a prosperity gospel mission, and this doesn't necessarily have to do with monetary wealth. Matter of fact, it really has nothing to do with monetary wealth, Um, although sometimes that can be a part of of what God wants to do to help the world and, and people around you. So if, if people have monetary wealth, that, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's really only a bad thing if you worship it. But the reality is, is that so often um, good things happen uh, from a spiritual standpoint to people that, that possess the most of Jesus. Um, now that doesn't, again, I want to be careful how I say this because there, tragedy happens to everybody. Bad things happen. But if a large portion of the inheritance from God is joy and hope, people who tend to be Christ-centered have a greater portion of joy and hope and love. It's just the way it is. I know that the closer I am to Christ, the more that I feel love and joy and peace and patience, the fruit of the Spirit the more, the more I'm filled with those things, um, the, the, the more that I feel like I possess Jesus, the more of the blessings I feel like that I have. We have to transcribe blessing from kind of our, our imprint of blessing. Does that mean that I won't experience tragedy because I, I try to possess a lot of Jesus? Absolutely not. But it does mean that in those tragic moments, I might have more joy or hope than some people. If I didn't have a lot of Jesus, I couldn't do my job. Because part of my job is to walk into really dark situations and try to insert hope. Now, every one of us are called to do that in some way, shape, or form. And our ability to do that is relative to how much of Christ we possess. I've told you this story before, and I'll say it again real quick. But when I was at my last church, I was, I was on what they called a, a congregational care team. And, and, well, they called it crisis care. And we would literally carry around a phone. Like a 20, we had, took a 24-hour shift. And for those 24 hours, if there was any crisis or any situation that came up, people were to call that number. And so you would literally, for 24 hours, you would have this phone, and if that thing rang, you knew there was a crisis on the other end of it. Well, we went through training. We went through training, and, and the training was not scenario training. The, the training was intimacy with Christ training. Because you can't plan for every scenario. You can't do it. There's just no way. And not only that, but the solution isn't necessarily a scripted one. What you can do is walk into a situation and carry Jesus in there with you and be ready to do whatever he wants to do in that moment. That's all you can do. Maybe he just wants you to sit with somebody and love them. Maybe he'll give you some some wisdom, maybe some scripture to pass on. But for the most part, your job is not to have all the answers. Your job is to have the one who has the answers. Do, Do you do that? This is, this is that picture, this is the picture as they, as they possess the land because of past mistakes. They're still possessing the land, but their portion isn't all that it could have been. And that's the sad truth about us. When, when we 
uh, choose the world or we neglect possessing Christ, our possession isn't all that it could be. And sadly, we can find ourselves completely unprepared for when crisis happens. I'm not, I, I, so what I'm going to do with this to kind of get so we can get through this text is I'm not going to read the names of all the cities. I'd probably butcher them all anyway. But it goes on and it kind of describes the, the parameters. Just know uh, that it's very detailed and God is very detailed. Uh, we're going to jump to verse 14. So verse 14, we're going to jump down and it said, Moses did not assign any allotment to the land of the tribe of Levi. Instead, as the Lord had promised them, their allotment came from the offerings burned on the altar to the Lord, the God of Israel. So the, Le the, the, the Levites were a tribe of people who were basically the priests of Israel. And that's what they did. Rather than possessing a land, they served the synagogues. Um, you know, you could say, you know, like people in ministry. That's what they do. They served the synagogues, and, and they would be located in every city. So they'd be dispersed. So in a way, you know, they didn't get the land, but they actually got something better because they got to serve Jesus. They got to serve God. They got to serve the Lord. Uh, Jesus, you could say, in a sense, although it would be much later before he came to the earth, but the Son, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, they get to be the priests, and they get to be located in every city serving the synagogues. This is also why we have the 12 tribes minus Levi, because we have the two, Manasseh and Ephraim, are the two of Joshua's sons, so we still have 12, 12 territories. He goes on to talk about, so it says that, uh, he goes on to talk about the, the land that's assigned to the, the tribe of Reuben. Again, I'm not going to read all the details. Uh, if you really want to read that, go for it. Um, not that I want to dismiss it, it's still scripture. But it's a lot of names that are hard to pronounce. <laughs> and I think I might get exhausted if I tried to read them all. So um, let's go down to, Again, so we go to 24, starting in verse 24, it talks about Moses assigned the following area to the clans of the tribe of Gad. Now remember, three, two and a half on the east side of the Jordan. So then, then we have the, he signed the following area of the clans of the half tribe of Manasseh. So we have Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh, uh, and, and all the, the, the assignment, the, the distribution, the possession of their land, um, so it says, verse 32, these are the allotments Moses had made while he was on the plains of Moab across the Jordan River east of Jericho. But Moses gave no allotment of land to the tribe of Levi. Again, it says this twice. For the Lord God of Israel had promised that he himself would be their allotment. I, I want to stop right there. And again, so there's just a lot of things that, that we kind of struggle with in our cultural views. Number one, um, you know, we go back to this idea that, that God said to Joshua, you're getting old, but there's a lot to do. We've kind of geared ourselves to set an age in our society where maybe we work until a certain age and then we just stop. And then from there, life becomes all about recreation. And we use the term retirement. Um, one, one of the things I want us to remember, because we work so hard for retirement, right? Um, retirement is a modern concept. Um, I'm not saying that you shouldn't plan for retirement. I'm not saying that. But it's a completely total modern concept. It's only in recent times that people had the amount of money where they could actually retire. Um, it's just a whole new concept. If you think about it, it's not even 100 years old yet in the world. Now, before that, it was a concept that people reach a physical age where they can't work anymore. And, and maybe they've, they have some, uh, maybe they, hopefully they own their property and, 
and hopefully, you know, all these things. But the reality is, is the reason why they implemented Social Security in our country is because a lot of people, they hit a certain age of life, and they had nobody to take care of them. And so this is, but this has altered our society. But somewhere in the midst of all this, it's crept into our thinking that 65 is the age where we're no longer valued anymore. Now maybe you don't feel that way and hopefully nobody here feels that way. But if, if you think that I've reached the point in my life where I can just pursue fun, what? What is, what is that? What if you pursue fun, but you carry Jesus wherever you go? What if the three things that we talked about, wisdom and the word and, and drawing close to Jesus, you never retire from that? And if you are at a point in life where you travel, and, or maybe you, you, know, you do, you're, you're, the, you're the patriarch of your family or the matriarch of your family, and maybe uh, you, you know, however you live out your elder years, what a blessing you can be to your family and your community. If you're a person that's cultivated wisdom, that knows the word of God, and has this deep relationship with Jesus, no matter what stage of life you get to. It's important that we understand that. So don't, don't be thinking, don't look at an age in the future and say, oh, when I get to that point, I can relax. Some people will tell you they've never been busier since they retired. Um, so we have to be careful about our perspective. Other people, they hit that age, they just stop doing stuff, and I'm telling you, life goes downhill in a hurry without a purpose. So my hope is, is during this time of, of possessing more of Christ and during this time of, of moving into the promises of God, you know what your purpose is for here on earth. And, you know, I'm hoping that your purpose is not you. Because I'm going to tell you with love, you might have misread it. There's got to be some higher purpose in your life. There's got to be something, something that transcends your life, something that makes it worthwhile, something that no matter what happens around you, you have this purpose that keeps you persevering through life. As the old saying goes, what makes you get up in the morning? If it's you, you might hit snooze. If it's something higher than you, you'll do it. So, you know, as you, as we kind of, again, we're talking about Advent, we're talking about moving into this season of, of preparation for, the, for Christmas, if you don't make room for Jesus in your life, you're going to fly right into it. And you'll probably get to the point where it's Christmas Day, and maybe you'll have some fleeting moment of happiness and satisfaction, but most likely, you'll be relieved when it's over. And I don't, I don't think that's the way we're meant to do it. I'll tell you what, there's nothing I love more. Nothing that means more to me than Christmas Eve and Christmas morning. I love it. Sometimes I feel like an old Scrooge because I don't want to jump to Christmas till after Thanksgiving. But I'll tell you what, there's a reason why I do that. I like the anticipation of Christmas. I like it because I know I'm waiting for Jesus to come back. I'm waiting for him to come back. And oh boy, I can't wait till he does. But I'm not going to jump the gun and give up hope. I'm not going to get to a place as well, this isn't going to happen for a while, so you know what? I'm just going to do what I want because he's not coming back for a while. No, I'm, I'm in anticipation of Jesus coming back. I know that I have an inheritance in heaven. I, I'm called to steward the resources God gives me. But this is not the best. The best is yet to come. Perspective. Perspective, perspective, perspective. As they say, uh, you know, again, I heard this, and it really sunk in the first time I heard it. 
Look, folks, if life is a journey, this is not the final destination. It's a rest area, or whatever you want to call it. It's a layover in an airport. It's whatever analogy you want. It's the place where we are, are, are temporarily uh, positioned before we can begin and reach our final destination. Do we look at life that way? You know, some airports are really nice. You know, you ever hear the, you know, what was that story about that guy that ended up living in an airport because he couldn't get a, he couldn't get a visa or so he was stuck in this airport? Oh, was that Tom Hanks? What was that movie? I don't remember what it was. What's that? Terminal. Terminal. We're all living in, we're all living in the airport and we think it's awesome. We think it's great. This is fantastic. I don't even, I, I, I lose sight of my final destination. Because this is kind of cool. They have great restaurants here. They have whatever. Don't do that or you're going to miss it. This is about possessing the fullness of what God has to offer. I want to read for you, a, um, again, I, I've told you that we've been working our way through this uh, by following this book. Um, and there was something that really jumped out at me in, in this um, that I wanted to share with you. Um, let me jump there here for a second. Sorry, I've got this all, all messed. Okay. So when we talk about perspective, I, this, this, just, this just hit me like a ton of bricks as I read this. But stop and pause for a moment and think about, think about the journey that you're on. I think about where it ends. He writes, it may only be the author's flight of imagination, but somehow I picture that day when you and I individually will have a personal interview for the first time with the Lord in heaven. Oh, it'll be, a one, it'll be how wonderful it'll be to see him. When the struggles and the battles are ended, do you think that on that day he will show us the, he showed to us the pattern that he had for our lives from before the foundation of the world? Do you think he will show us the place where we were sidetracked? The place, the place where, we, where we lost? The place where by lack of faith and lack of obedience we went into second, some second best? Will he show us the place of his abundant mercy? Will we see more clearly than anywhere else in life that just there where we slipped? He left the mark of his blood and the imprint of his hands on our lives as he held us when we sought to get out of his grip. All I pray is that on that day, for you as well as for me, if he does show us the blueprint of his plans for our lives, we shall discover by his grace that the actual experience was in some measure at least in line with that plan. So in other words, you get to the end of your life and you stand before Jesus. What's he going to say? Is he going to say, you know what? I know it was hard. And you had faith and I carried you and you experienced so, uh, so many of the blessings that I had for you. Or is he going to look at you and say, you know what? I know that you love me. But I had a lot more to give you than what you received. Because you were so busy with the world. You allowed the world to distract you. You allowed the world to, to steal your perspective. And, and, you, and you just got so caught up in what the world was doing. Instead of turning to me, you turned to the world. And I had so much more to give you. Now, the good news is this is not a salvational issue. Salvation is not about what you do. It's about what Christ has done. And you put your faith in that. You're good to go salvationally. But does that mean that you receive all the blessings that he has to offer you? I think, I think that we as Americans someday are going to weep at what we chased after and what we let go of that God promises us. We, we think things are so good. Brand new car. I don't know what it is. 
a, a boat, a, a motorcycle, I don't know, uh, I, whatever it is. And again, these things are, there's nothing wrong with these things unless they steal our perspective and we get filled with them instead of Jesus. You can't blame a, a material item because it really doesn't do anything but just sit there. We're the ones that make it the center of our lives. We're the ones that seek happiness in it. We're the ones that turn from God and look into things that were never meant to be looked into. Jesus said, what good does it do you to gain the whole world but lose your soul? And I'll tell you what, there's no better, better illustration of this than Christmas time. If you hit Christmas Day and you don't feel closer between now and then, if you don't feel closer to Jesus, then something has happened, and it's not what should happen. This is that moment where you set aside time to allow Christ into your life and possess greater portions of the land. I want to end this by reading for you um, from 1 Peter. 1 Peter 1. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll get there. As my Bible gets older, all the pages start to stick together, and you can see it's falling apart. <laughs> okay. So I want to start. I want to read for you 1 Peter uh, 1, verse 3. Uh, Peter writes, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's by his great mercy that we've been born again. Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, now we live with great expectation, and we have a priceless inheritance an inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed on the last day for all to see. So be truly glad. There is wonderful joy ahead, even though you have to endure many trials for a little while. These trials will show that your faith is genuine. It's being tested as fire tests and purifies gold, though your faith is far more precious than mere gold. So when your faith remains strong through many trials, it'll bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Jesus Christ is revealed to the whole world. You love him even though you've never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. So now's the time to begin making more room in your life for Christ. So I'm going to pray for us, and then we're, what better way to do it than to enter into a time of communion? So as the praise team comes up here, I'd like to pray for us, uh, and then we'll move into communion. Would you join me in prayer, please? Father God, I thank you so much for your word today. And Lord, I do, I just... Uh, I pray, Lord, that you would help us maintain the perspective that we need as we enter into this season. There's no guarantee of anything being easy. We know that tragedy, hard times, suffering, they don't know what season it is. But Lord, we can be with you no matter whether we're in a valley or we're on a mountaintop. So what we do now is we cling to you and we invite you in. We make room for you in our hearts. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you bridge that gap between heaven and earth. Where would we be without it? We thank you, Lord, that you had this plan to bring your people, uh, deliver them, and bring them into the promised land. Lord, you love us. And you have these wonderful gifts for us. And we don't have to earn them. All we have to do is follow you. So Lord Jesus, move in our lives. Continue to strengthen us. Use this time. Bless these elements to, uh, to just draw us closer into your presence. We love you, Lord. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I was reminded of a story as we were singing that song. It was a story of it. story of a, a group of people um, 
that were praying for somebody who had terminal cancer. And it was way before their time. And they were praying. And somewhere in the midst of the prayer, they started singing, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. I got to tell you, there is something in this world that transcends the temporary. And that's Jesus. I don't know where you stand today. I don't know, I don't know what you're chasing in life. But I can tell you, if it doesn't include him, it's an empty well. Because life is hard. There's all kinds of challenges. There's battles. There's struggles in it. And I'm telling you, when you have Christ, when you possess him and you have this great measure of Christ in your life, you can be in any situation and have a hope that transcends it. And you can stand there and say, praise God, from whom all blessings flow. And you can mean it. So I want to urge you as you leave here today, and I just pray during this Advent season, that over the weeks that follow, on up until Christmas Day, you'll be receiving more and more of Jesus into your life. And that hope and joy and love and all the things that are offered will just grow in you as well. So I'm going to dismiss you now. Before I do, please stand receive this blessing. As you leave here today, I pray that you go now knowing the love of God the Father, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the Son, and the fellowship and the power of the Holy Spirit now and always. God bless you. You're dismissed. Have a great day.